Well, thank you very much. I'm really excited for the invitation and for the chance to talk to you all today. And so we're using Blue Waters to try and simulate dark matter interactions with nuclei. And this is actually a, product, a project that we've just started running on Blue Waters two months ago. So I won't have too much in the way of final results yet, but I will talk to you about our performance on Blue Waters, what we're trying to do, and for starters, why this is something interesting to try and calculate and why you need a computer like Blue Waters to do it. And the principal investigator on the project is Fiala Shanahan, who just started a faculty at MIT last year. And Professor William Detmold and a postdoc David Murphy, both at MIT, have also been deeply involved with the project. So it's rather remarkable how much we do understand about the world. And basically any low energy process that you can measure in a lab is consistent with a theory of interactions coming from just four forces. Uh, gravity, we sort of started understanding first, but now understand worst. And we know that it, at very high energies, there's something off about gravity. But at the scales that I'm going to be looking at today, gravity is pretty irrelevant. And so there are three other forces to worry about. There's electromagnetism holding together atoms. There's the weak force responsible for radioactive decays of nuclei. And there's the strong force that binds together quarks and gluons inside protons and neutrons and binds those together inside nuclei. And those three forces can be understood within a unified framework called the standard model of particle physics that is so simple that the defining equation for it can fit on a coffee cup. However, there are things that are not part of the standard model of particle physics. And in fact, 95% of all things seem to not be part of the standard model of particle physics. And this is quite a mystery. And we look out at the sky and we have astrophysical and cosmological observations that provide compelling evidence for this pie chart shown here that about 70% of the energy content of the universe has to be in the form of some sort of dark energy that looks like a cosmological constant. A quarter of it is some cold, weakly or non-interacting dark matter, and then 5% is everything else. And if you try and take precision observations of, say, the, the cosmic microwave background, uh, the, the static on your TV screen coming from the Big Bang, and you, you look at a fit where you assume that all the particles in there are baryons and visible matter, and you can't get anywhere close to the data. So this is the sort of evidence telling us that dark matter really is out there. But we really don't know very much about it. And there's a whole landscape of possible theories for different models of dark matter that we'd like to disentangle. And the only way we're going to be able to do this is if we can actually detect dark matter interacting with something else in a lab and start really getting experimental handles on it. And direct detection experiments are the most, well, direct way of trying to get at this, where you take a, a large underground volume detector and you look for nuclei recoiling from a collision with something invisible inside of the detector. And if it's something invisible, well, that's our dark matter, as long as it's not a neutrino or some other backgrounds that you have to worry about. But by and large, experiments so far with these direct detection experiments have come up null. We have no direct detections of dark matter. And so what we get out of these are exclusion plots telling us that the the interaction strength or cross-section of a, a dark matter particle on a nucleus must be smaller than some threshold that they'd be able to measure. And what's really done to be able to compare different experiments using different nuclei, and they all like to use heavy nuclei for sensitivity, is to use some sort of nuclear theory to relate the WIMP nucleus cross-section to the WIMP nucleon cross-section. At most basic, this is just assuming an impulse approximation that you scatter coherently of all the nucleons in the nucleus, and it just sort of adds up. And these sort of impulse approximations are still being used today, though we're getting better. So this impulse approximation is, is sort of your zeroth order picture of a nucleus that you should have in your head. That if you think of some dark matter particle trying to have some spin-dependent interaction with a nucleus, then generally the, the spins of nucleons tend to pair to zero, and nuclei have much smaller spin than their baryon number. And so a spin-dependent interaction will only couple to these unpaired nucleons, while a spin-independent or scalar interaction will couple to everything. And so if you have a really big nucleus, then these scalar spin-independent interactions are the ones that you care about. 
And so they're the ones that we'd like to go try and understand the scalar interactions of nuclei starting from the standard model. So, okay, how do we do that? Well, Feynman taught us that anything in quantum mechanics can be represented by a path integral. It's sort of a formal object. But if you take your space-time volume to be a finite box and have a lattice of points in your space-time, then you only have a finite number of points in space-time and a configuration space that you can actually sample with well-defined regularized integrals. And lattice field theory at the end of the day is just a way of regularizing these infinities that show up in path integrals. And once you have then this discrete lattice version of your theory, the idea is to simulate where you can and then take the continuum limit where you recover the physics that you want. The quark part of this turns out to be easy. You can analytically perform the path integral for a determinant. So what we need to do is numerically Monte Carlo sample possible gluon fields. And then on each one, we calculate quark propagators. And this part is just linear algebra. So a quark propagator is just the inverse of this matrix shown here. So all we need to do is solve mx equals b, where I've given mx and b slightly more complicated names. Um, but the problem is that since this exists everywhere in space-time, this is a billion by billion dimensional matrix, and so the linear algebra becomes complicated. But once you have it, more complex observables are just built from tensor products and contractions of these quark propagators. So, okay, you can even do nuclei this way. So far, everything's been done at unphysically quark masses, unphysically heavy quark masses, for reasons I'll mention in a moment. And that naive shell model that I mentioned a minute ago actually does a pretty good job of describing what nuclei roughly look like, both in the real world and in this fictitious world of unphysically heavy quark masses. And this didn't have to be that way and points to some underlying simplicity of QCD that we don't really understand yet. But we observed that magnetic moments of light nuclei calculated by the NPL QCD collaboration back in 2014 are pretty close to the predictions that you would expect from just adding up the spins. And we can go on and do further. So we can also look at couplings to some external probe by turning on a background field. And at the MPL QCD collaboration a couple years ago, we were able to perform these sort of calculations with the background axial field, isolate the, you know, not the multi-body parts of the interactions, and derive from the standard model the coupling between two nucleons and an axial current that's the primary ingredient in predicting the proton-proton fusion rate the start of the stellar fusion chain. And the number that we get from QCD still has quite large uncertainties, but is consistent with the number phenomenologically extracted from stellar astrophysics. So the sun seems consistent with quarks and gluons. And our naive shell model, again, works better than it has any right to. And these axial matrix elements um, are shown here as fractional differences from the naive shell model, and there are only about 1% differences coming from QCD. Um, and for the record, the one in the middle there actually tells you something about the spin content of quarks in the nucleus and how it relates to the spin content of the quarks in the nucleon. So there's really a, a lot of physics that you can get at with these sort of methods. And the one I want to talk about here today, though, is dark matter in nuclei. So we can look at a background scalar field to simulate spin-independent dark matter interactions. And we find that in this case, the deviations from the naive shell model are significantly larger than for axial currents. And for light quarks coupling to a scalar field, it's a 1% a effect in the deuteron, a 4% effect in the triton. And for couplings to strange quarks, these effects are about 10%. And you know, 10% is nothing to write home about for results that are usually presented on a log plot. But if it's true that QCD effects on scalar couplings are generically larger than axial couplings, then this would be important for trying to really reliably understand these dark matter direct detection experiments and understand what theories we're actually excluding with the data that we have today. But all our calculations so far are in this fictitious world of unphysically heavy quark masses. So if we want to actually go to the experimentalists and say this is what we think we think you're actually probing with these sort of experiments, we need to do better than that and get our approximations under control. And that gets hard. So calculating these lake quark propagators 
uh, becomes difficult because the matrices become ill-conditioned and your solver time diverges as you take the quark mass as light. Your Monte Carlo noise grows exponentially as your quark masses are reduced or your nucleus gets bigger. And we need large lattices to be able to fit nuclei. These require large amounts of memory. And most of our, our steps okay, um, are just linear algebra. So things like GPUs are really efficient for lattice QCD calculations, but we need a huge amount of memory to be able to store these lattices on GPUs. And that's where something like large GPU node jobs on blue waters started looking really appealing to us. And so the software that we're actually using then is developed by the US QCD meta collaboration. Um, there's libraries at the bottom that handle parallelizing the lattice into subvolumes, and then libraries in the middle that are optimized for nice solvers on GPUs, and libraries on the top that are the actual application level. And the other critical one for us not shown here is QDP JIT, which uses LLVM to compile directly down to GPU instructions, even the parts of the code that aren't specifically written in CUDA or CUDA, the quantum CUDA. Uh, and this JIT compilation effectively ports everything at the application level to the GPUs and lets us avoid having bottlenecks of unoptimized pieces of code slowing everything down. Then what the algorithm that we're trying to solve is generating these gluon field configurations. And this is just Monte Carlo, but it's a weird sort of Monte Carlo because we have a non-local action and a, a billion dimensional configuration space. So the standard technique is something called hybrid Monte Carlo, where you use molecular dynamics to explore your configuration space while keeping your action constant so that you can get decently high accept reject at the end of the day. But it's still not quite enough, and we have these determinants to deal with. We can't calculate them exactly because they're billion by billion dimensional matrices. And so the standard trick is to rewrite your determinants in terms of some new path integral over some fictitious scalar fields called pseudofermions. Then once we have these, you can use another trick called Hasenbusch preconditioning to rewrite your determinants as ratios of determinants where the quark masses will be closer in these than your light quark masses to zero. Um, and for strange quarks, there's yet another different family of tricks for dealing with these determinants and the fact that we really need to take a square root and then do some rational approximation of it. Okay. The real essential one for getting down to light quark masses, though, is multigrid. And I'm sure you're all familiar with multigrid algorithms in some contexts, but for us, the way we think about it is that there are low modes of the Dirac operator that are the ones responsible for making this matrix horribly ill-conditioned as we approach zero quark mass. And these low modes are smooth, and they're less low on a coarser grid. So we coarsen, we solve the low modes, we smooth, we prolongate back, and we basically just consider that a preconditioner for an outer Krylov iterative solver on the fine grid. And these sort of multigrid algorithms have just done amazing things in the last decade. So here's a plot of seconds per solve as a function of quark mass and really ignore the units, but lighter is this way. Uh, and the black curve at the bottom that doesn't go crazy is multigrid. Um, and it scales nicely, gives 10x speed ups at least for light quark solvers. So how are we actually doing on blue water? Well, the lattices that we're trying to create are pretty large, um, 48 cubed by 96, or the big one, 64 cubed by 128. The smaller lattice fits well on 192 nodes, um, any smaller, and you're starting to get memory bottlenecks. And it's pretty much dominated by the light quark solver, um, which itself I have split into sections at the bottom. Setting up this multigrid thing accounts for a, a quarter of the time, and then the rest of it is splitting up these different ratios of determinants. Um, and as we go to bigger lattices, the really cool thing here is that the light quark solver becomes a smaller fraction of the total cost on larger lattices. And without multigrid, that would be an order of magnitude the other direction. Finally, once we have our lattices, we need to actually build nuclei on them. And here, there's, again, a few steps of creating your quark sources and then creating, again, these propagators by solving this Dirac equation. And here, the, the thing to notice is that if you're just computing one quark propagator per gluon field, 
we're in trouble. Because even with multigrid, setting up the multigrid solver takes you know, a close to 100% of the time to do that calculation. But you can use the same multigrid null space for every propagator that you calculate on this gluon field. And so if we calculate 500 of them, then multigrid null space setup becomes a small fraction of the cost. Um, this thing called baryon blocks here would actually become the largest piece of the cost. And so that's something that we've been worrying about for the last couple months at MIT and have a new trick where we basically compress the way our baryon blocks are stored. And that gives us a factor of 100 times speed up on that piece of the calculation. And so now it's actually creating the quark wave functions. That's the, the largest piece. And this is simply because it's now the piece that has been optimized the least. So that's something that we're thinking about going forward now that the, the real challenging parts that we were most worried about seem to be under control and moving along smoothly on blue waters. We're going back and thinking more about how we can get this down even further. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we just began running in April of this year. And so I have no results to show yet, but stay tuned because this will be our first chance to actually simulate nuclei with physical quark masses directly from the standard model. So we'll be able to get definitive results for these scalar charges at at least this one volume and one lattice spacing. But the same lattices can be reused for other calculations. So these axial calculations of fusion rates, things like double beta decay. And we're going to make these lattices publicly available to other members of the USQCD community and the, the lattice QCD community uh, to really be able to maximize the impact of the production that we're having generating these. And lastly, I just want to give a, a big thank you to the Blue Waters team for helping us get set up with all of this, as it's really just thanks to machines like this and good algorithms that we have any hope of being able to get at this sort of interesting physics directly from the standard model. Thank you.